Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft. I release new episodes on the full and new moons every month. I recently found out that you can leave reviews for the podcast on Amazon Podcasts, so if you want to help the podcast grow, be sure to leave a review over there as well as on Apple Podcasts. This is the first episode of 2022 and the first episode of my second season. I got to talk to half of the long-running podcast New World Witchery, Corey Hutchison. Corey talks about finding enchantment in everyday life, wonders if his house has a name, and tells a story about a walk in the woods. And don't worry, the other half of New World Witchery is coming soon. Now let's get to the stories. Hi, Corey. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. You actually caught me right with a mouthful of coffee there for a second. Oh, That's great. Sorry. Do you want me to do it again? No, you're fine. No, it's an auspicious start. If we if we get all the, the, <laughs> the, the giggles and goofs out of the way at the beginning, it'll be fantastic. I, I, I have faith. I mean, if I'm going to interview somebody, I hope there's snacks. So <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Fair enough. Where's the craft table? Let's, yeah. Oh my gosh, craft yes. services, yeah. Would you please introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Corey Thomas Hutchison. Uh, I identify with uh, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, live on uh, occupied Lenape land uh, here in Pennsylvania. Um, I am author of a book called New World Witchery, also co-host of a podcast called also New World Witchery, website New World Witchery, pretty much all socials do some version of either <laughs> new world witchery or i think twitter is the one where we have nw witchery just because they couldn't fit the whole thing for our handle when, when we first signed up um so those are kind of all the places you can find us um also a uh, college professor i teach um mostly writing courses but i also teach folklore fairy tales uh things like that um so uh that's really my specialty is folklore uh related stuff and particularly folk magic folk witchcraft things like that so that's i think that I think that covers me. I think that's most of it. I love that you told me whose land you live on. I think I'm going to add that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's something um, I, you know, just in the past couple of years, it's become really, really more present um, for me to be thinking about that. Like that's actually um, something that I'm, I don't, we don't talk about it, but I actually try to make sure that we spend a portion of the show's budget every month sort of as um, the way I think of it is sort of a, a very, very small drop in the bucket kind of rent to the Lenape nation yeah. because that's the place, that's the place where I live. So that's, I want to make sure that there's some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of the sort of land back movement, uh, in general. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to be sort of thinking in that direction as much as I can. So. Me too. I know I live on Tohono, mm -hmm. Tohono Odom land mm -hmm. and if I'm slaughtering it, everyone, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, no, I mean, we do the best we do the best we can. Yeah. That's, I mean, you're also pretty close to Diné territory, right? I don't know. I'm just thinking like that's, that might be down, down where you are too. But yeah, no, that's wonderful. I love, I love that you're, that you're aware of that too. That's, that, that's, that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing that that's come out of the past couple of years is that we're all much more aware of yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, and the Yaki. I know I live near the Yaki. There's some of oh, yes. those people yeah. here too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So... What made you want to start a podcast? I'm sorry, that's not on there, but what made you want to start a podcast? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so about this, about witchcraft, I mean. About witchcraft. I, I could have been anything. And in fact, um, Elaine and I do have another podcast, which is um, All Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yes. uh, which really just came out of the fact that we wanted to formally uh, and and for the for the permanent record geek out about our love of <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, which is what we do. We just basically do that. And I, I actually have a separate podcast as well called Chasing Foxfire, which is all about folklore intersecting with um, uh, tons of other stuff too. But um, but yeah, so the New World Witchery podcast, which is our biggest one and the one that I think, I think you're really kind of talking about here and the one that's been going on for so long, really came out of one uh, I had been living overseas at the time, um, and I'd always been very interested in witchcraft, um, but it had, had long been kind of uh, sort of in the sort of eclectic pagan sort of framework that I'd, I'd experienced it. And I moved overseas to teach English for a little while, and I was living in kind of Central Europe, and everything there just had this very strong folkloric feel. There was just stuff there that folklore was a very lived experience uh, in the places that I lived. And I was living in a very cosmopolitan city. I was living in Prague. Um, but folklore mm. was very present there. Um, and so when we moved back, I was kind of looking around and I was like, boy, I really wish I had some of that. 
here and it sort of clicked into place as like wait a second i lived in the south um you know, <laughs> it's not that there's a shortage of folklore anywhere uh i just have to you know tune in and turn on to that because it was it it's it was so ingrained in my experience that i just hadn't had i hadn't taken the time to sort of give myself fresh eyes to look at it and when i did that i was like oh wow this is really amazing i wonder if this is true for other parts of north america and the more i dug the more i was like this really is then why is the conversation on witchcraft so often focused? And this was a good 10, 10 to 15 years ago at this point. It was so often focused on kind of this experience of British traditional witchcraft, um, European traditional witchcraft, these kind of European inf and influenced and inflected versions of witchcraft, which is wonderful. Nothing against that. But I was saying, I was seeing, you know, well, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. You've got, uh, you know, the Pennsylvania Germans uh, having Brakarai and powwow practices. Um, you have Southern Conjure and Hoodoo and uh, Root Work and all these kind of diverse practices in the South. Um, and just all these different kind of regional specializations that then crossed into each other and fed into different places. And the more I was looking at that, the more I was like, this is amazing. Why is no one talking about this? And at that same time, I was also really, really invested in Peter Padden's Crooked Path podcast, uh, which was still one of my all-time favorite podcasts that I've ever listened to um, because it was so rich with lore and uh instruction and you know really well thought out sort of uh philosophy of witchcraft um i, I miss him almost every day i think about peter Patton and just just what a loss that is um but then you know in look in, in hearing his podcast i was like i wonder if anybody would be interested in something kind of like this but for this kind of north american framework of witchcraft and lane and i had started working together and i just kind of brought it up to to her and said, well, you know, I'm thinking about doing this podcast. What do you, what do you think? And I'd, for, and I'd actually even written some scripts that were just kind of solo scripts at the time. And she's like, I want in on this. This is, you know, let's, let's do this thing. And so we just, you know, completely kind of revamped what we were thinking and said, let's have some conversations about this. Let's make this a search rather than a sort of like, um, you know, series of essays, which at the time I was like, maybe I can get a good 10 to 15 essays out of this. <laughs> And so when we turned it into a conversation, it really, it blossomed. And I mean, we, I think we just hit 200 episodes um, released today officially. And that's not counting like all of our little bonus episodes and things like that that go along with it. So um, it, yeah, there's still a lot to say. We're not even close to the bottom of the well on North American folk magic. And we, we want to keep exploring and keep doing that for as long as we can. Good. That makes me happy. Yours was actually the first one that I found. The first really? podcast about oh. witchcraft, like, I don't know hey. how many years ago. Oh, that's fun. I love that. We're the first blossom of, of, of witchy spring. We're the, we're the snowdrop. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I don't expect you going to go into super detail, but can you explain a little bit about your practice? And if you have any daily rituals, could you share one or two with us? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, my practice, it, I mean, there's daily, there's weekly, there's monthly, and then there's annual slash occasional stuff that kind of goes into it. And my daily practices are um, basically uh, I have a very brief protection ritual, uh, basically a variation on the LBRP that I do just to kind of set, set a sort of basic ward for the day uh, for myself. Um, and then uh, I also do uh, in the evenings, I will spend some time. I'll go to the heart of my house, um, which is kind of just the center space in, in the house that I'm living and I'll, you know, touch the walls and I'll tell the house, thank you. And I'll sort of enumerate the things I'm thankful for the house doing for the day. And then um, say, okay, so now have a good night and rest and we'll see you in the morning kind of a thing. Um, because I do feel I'm a very kind of animistic person. And I, I, if, if I can, if I can touch it or see it or hear it, I want to talk to it. Mm -hmm. I'm, very talkative. I'm a Gemini son, so I'm very loquacious, <laughs> and very talkative, if you haven't noticed. Um so, so yeah, so I do that. And then I have a prayer of gratitude that I, I do at the end of every day as well. That's just sort of enumerating the things that I'm thankful for for the day um, before I go to bed as well. Um, so those are kind of the daily things. And then I do weekly ancestor stuff and spirit um, offerings and things like that. Monthly, I do both um, full and new moon observances. Um, there's some divination that goes into the new moon stuff. And there's, uh, you know, more sort of celebratory stuff on the, the full moons. And then, you know, I do have holidays. I don't really follow, you know, what I think is called, what I think is sort of thought of as the, the wheel of the year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not, I really follow a lot more kind of stuff that's just in my region and sort of seasonal to me. 
Um, so that, that's kind of what I do there. And then, you know, have occasional things as well, uh, where like maybe a specific need arises or a specific, you know, celebration is going on that I want to participate in. So that's kind of my practice, I guess. Does your house have a name? No, that's a really interesting question. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, I always kind of think of it as this, you know, as the numbers that are the address um, and the sort hmm. of, uh, or I think of it as um, uh, the, I, the name of the street. I think of it as the, uh, the blank street house, you know, uh, that, that's kind of how I think of it. But that's so fascinating. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be asking it to, to sort of tell me if it wants to have a name uh, and see, see what it tells me. Because that's really a good question. I love that. Well, Macy from the Witch Bitch Amateur Hour named her house. Mm -hmm. And I thought, huh, I should talk to my house more. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, we do that with cars and stuff all the time. Although, honestly, my, like my current car, because it really was my wife's car for so long, um, uh, it doesn't have uh, a name that I know of. I, she may have given it one, but never told it to me. Um, but, you know, pr prior to this, I definitely have always had um, cars that had names. So, Me too. And I inherited my current car, which also does not have a name. Huh. It's weird. It's it's, a, it's an odd thing. It's, it's weird to drive a car without a name, honestly, because <laughs> I don't know what to call it when I'm like, okay, let's do this thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. Gonna make, make it another 20 miles before we stop for gas. You know? Yeah. I, I thank it pretty frequently for not mm -hmm. getting hit by that one guy or. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for doing not falling down on the road. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, what does it mean to you when you call yourself a witch? That's a really good question, and I like that you I like that you frame this now as, um, what does it mean to you when you call yourself this, as opposed to like what is a witch? Um, because I think I think when you were when you uh, I listened to some of your older episodes, and I think that was kind of how how you asked it um in some of the earlier episodes, and that I was thinking like well. Like I could give my whole like folkloric historical definition <laughs> of that, but I really like kind of in turn kind of reflecting on this as a sort of like, what does it mean to me? And to me, it means what I mean by that when I say that to somebody is that I'm somebody who works with um, magic, uh, primarily folk magic, uh, that that also is inflected by um, spirit relationships, that I have relationships and you know, contracts, so to speak, or um, dialogues or interactions with really specific spirits that are not necessarily, you know, worshipful deity oriented relationships. They're often very, um, it's much, it's almost a, fam <laughs> it's a familiar relationship. And I use that with all of the nuance that term can have in this <laughs> conversation. Um, so, so yeah, it's this, it's very much kind of, um, magic, folk magic, especially spirit relationships, and then a willingness to, um, to practice within uh, a, a self-defined morality or self-defined sort of moral system so that it's not that I'm beholden to someone else's um, moral trappings, but that I have to make a case by case decision on whether or not each act of magic is morally warranted, um, which sometimes involves doing consultations with a divination system. Sometimes it involves just uh, recognizing, yep, I'm justified to do this right now because of X, Y, or Z. And it, does, it means that sometimes it's going to be nasty business. So there's going to be some, some nasty stuff that comes out of that. Um, and I think witchcraft, I don't think that there are versions of witchcraft that I've seen in history or folklore that completely eschew um, the nasty side of things, that they, they're almost always willing to at least get their hands a little dirty with some of the the the, the rough stuff if they need to. So. I mean, how could you not? <laughs> it would be so boring. The world <laughs> is not. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's got lots of parts. <laughs> it does. Lots of moving pieces. From what I gathered, listening to your podcast and reading the book, you didn't actually have anybody who called themselves a witch in your family history, right? Mm -mm. No, not that I'm aware of. With my um, mother's side of the family, there was a strong Catholic um, sort of inflection to it but it was definitely kind of a folk catholic thing i mean they were um, largely irish and polish there was a lot of emphasis on like storytelling and you know hearing especially the irish stuff um would sort of be something that my mom was really really interested in which meant there was a lot of sort of discussion of fairies and fairy beliefs um none of which was to sort of be like you know, it wasn't very victorian there was always the sort of sense of like yeah the fairies are you know the, here's an interesting story about the fairies also don't piss them off 
Please do not <laughs> piss them off. They can be very, very dangerous. Um, you know, always treat them nicely. Uh, maybe don't even call them fairies. Call them fair folk or call them the good neighbors, things like that. So, um, so Ooh, there's like that the kind good of stuff. neighbors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't. You, I mean, sometimes you just don't refer to them directly. Um, um, but there was this that kind of stuff sort of circulating around. But no, there was no. There definitely was nobody that would call themselves a witch because, again, that was that's a term that's very loaded. And until very recently, very few people were going to call themselves that um, just because there were some consequences to doing that. Um, uh, and nobody and really nobody within my family, you know, practiced magic at, for a living. Like there wasn't anybody that like, you know, um, read cards for a living or was sort of known as the village healer or anything like that. But it was interesting to me that the more I kind of dug into folk practices, the more I would sort of see the little bits and pieces um, that were present in my family. So things like, you know, saying the St. Anthony charm to find a lost object, right? So those were present, um, even though there was no sort of unified system of, of witchcraft there, and nobody was sort of claiming that title or that role either. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. That's what I like hearing, the little sneaky... No, of course not. Except we did throw salt all over, over our shoulder, and we did right, yeah. knock mm -hmm. on the knock on wood and kiss your hand and touch the roof when you go under train trestle. <laughs> yes. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Lift your lift your lift your uh, feet when you go over the the train yeah, tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Hold your breath past the graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Don't whistle. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Very good. I would have trouble with the not whistling. I don't whistle past for the some graveyard. reason. I just whistle. Yeah. I'm always whistling. Yeah. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> You got. You probably have a lot of ghost friends following you. Home. <laughs> you come on, I'm, I'm the Pied Piper. Like, no, go, no, I don't have room for you all. Go home. Go home. <laughs> what would you say is your first experience with witchcraft? And by first experience, I mean when you consciously decided, "Hey, I'm going to do a thing, and it's going to be witchcraft." I mean, it really. I mean, I, I was very captivated by witchcraft even as a young child, and I would do. Uh, you know, we had this big dirt hill near our house that I would go out to and I had this staff, this wooden tree limb that had fallen, but I had carved a little bit and put some swirls and symbols on it. And it was very like, you know, high fantasy, you know, sword and sorcery kind of wizard, Mage. wanting to be wizard kind of a thing. But I would do these things and I would hear about these techniques of like, all right, can you make the clouds move? All right, so I'll go stand out there and I'll kind of shout at the clouds and see if I can make them move or do what I want them to do. Can I make the wind listen to me and, and respond? And, you know, around that same time, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, um, I also kind of picked up my first book that had what I would call sort of real witchcraft in it, which is um, Patty Slade's. It was called the Encyclopedia of White Magic. I think it's anymore sort of under a re-release as Diary of a Village Witch. Um, and it's basically walking you through a lot of kind of traditional British witchcraft, um, you know, information, but there was a lot of folklore in it and that was stuff that appealed to me too. So, um, you know, the things like, you know, peeling an apple all in one strip and throwing it over your shoulder to yeah. figure out the initial of a future lover. Right. Um, uh, or, you know, making, I think there was like maybe making a pomander in there as well for, uh, you know, protection of your house and stuff, but that kind of stuff was very, um, very much I was like, oh, that that that's what I want to do. That's the stuff I want to do, which is funny because I also then went through a very like evangelical Christian phase for like a year and a half, two years right after that. Huh. But the magical side of it was I was always kind of like, you know, but the magic still exists. I just, you know, Abstain. I'm going to put this veneer <laughs> over it of, you know, but I only do the good stuff. No, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, that that was it was an interesting time to be 13. <laughs> 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 that's funny my first it was not when i was 11 it was like when i was 24 mm -hmm. but my first time actually seeing results was cloud bursting oh neat oh and that's my great. first book was called the hodgepodge book that my li elementary school librarian was like here this is cool you should look at this mm -hmm. and it was not meant at all <laughs> to have any kind of witchcraft in it, but it was. And so like five years ago, I went and I found another copy and yeah, it's, it's still in there. <laughs> That's awesome. I, yeah, I did the same thing. I went out and tracked down a copy of the Patty Slay book. Cause eventually I, I gave away that first copy I had, but it, it, there's something about that first book that you're like, I really want to have a copy. Yeah. Of this. <laughs> yeah. 
What would you say is your best or worst, worst witchcraft experience? And how do you think it affects your practice now? Best is pretty easy. Um, Lane and I, when we work together, we have some of the literally like just most sort of most world shifting, you know, uh, absolutely otherworldly experiences when we work together. So we used to work at this sort of abandoned, fallen down cottage in the middle of the woods Ooh, that was that near my house. Cool. <laughs> and like we would have to trek through the woods to get there. And I, we've talked about this on our show a lot, but like um, there was a time when we were lost. We couldn't find the, the cottage. And like, this is, you know, it's a dense forest, but we, it's not so dense that we couldn't find it most days. But it was late in the evening. We had some supplies. We were trying to get there. We'd already lost a bunch of time. Like uh, she had been waiting for me to, you know, go and set some stuff up at the cabin and then come back out. And when I came back out, she's like, where were you? I was like, well, I was only in there for like 20 minutes. She's like, it's been almost two hours. So there was this whole like time shift thing. And then we're like, okay, well let's, let's go in. And then we started getting lost. And, you know, finally we were like, oh man, I just, we don't know what we can do. We have these flashlights. Let's turn off the flashlights. Let's ask for some guidance. And so we pause, we turn off the flashlights and we say, you know, something like, you know, help us, um, help us the spirits of our craft. Can you lead us to uh, the hearthstone where we're trying to, trying to reach, take us past the, cause there's this little abandoned well, take us past the well uh, into, uh, in, in, into the home of our, our witchcraft, some, something to that effect. And we paused and we kind of were just quiet. We didn't hear anything around us. And then we flipped the lights on and not, not even 10 feet from us, there was a deer just standing there. And at first, I mean, when our lights first hit it, I thought it was a coyote. So I jumped in front of Lane and started made this oh, that's so insane nice. noise. I was like, <laughs> like, trying to scare the stupid thing off. Good for like, you. I, it was ridiculous, right? <laughs> Um, and so, but like, as soon as I did that, we both, we both kind of stopped and realized it was a deer and the deer did not run despite oh. me doing that. It just kind of looked at us like we were insane. <laughs> and then it turned and started walking and we followed it and it led us to our little hearthstone area by this sort of fallen down cabin with the big stone chimney where the stuff was for, for what we were doing that night. And then it just walked away into the woods. <laughs> It was like, what? <laughs> what is this? Imagine it so what remarkable. it thought when you freaked out. <laughs> like, Look, you, you called asked. me here. You, you asked jerk. for what this. Are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I am here for you. This is my day off. I do not have to be exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> Kevin called in. <laughs> this is the last time I take a call right before work and my, my shift ends. <laughs> All right, let's do this. <laughs> And it was crazy. It's so weird. That's amazing. It's so weird. I mean. I love validating stories like that. Oh, man. It was oh, just it, absolutely enchanting. So, yeah, that was way up there. And it's funny because it was a terrifying experience, too. It was very scary to be lost in the woods in the dark. Yeah. You know, not knowing what was going to happen. And, you know, to be fair, we, we almost never got ticks or anything either, which is oh. shocking. Yeah. Considering how wild the undergrowth was there. Huh. But. I mean, it's just something about that space. We made it our own, so it was nice. How do you think that affects your practice now, that mm. validation? Yeah, no, that's that's a good... I mean, I'm very, very willing to, to um, believe the experiences I have um, and sort of, sort of treat them as, um, as possibly, possibly something other than, than mundane. Um, so, uh, that r r reminds me a couple of years ago, I was at a, um, at the Philadelphia Pagan Pride Day. Um, I was there with, uh, uh, you know, Chris Rapello, uh, and, uh, Tara from down at the crossroads. Do you know that, that, that show? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was there with them and we're all kind of sitting around and there was this, um, woman. And I, th I think she was, um, I think she was an unhoused person who was just kind of wandering through this kind of pride day thing. And she was just trying to find somebody to talk to. And a lot of people were kind of like, you know, Doing they, what they do. Well, yeah, it's it's just uncomfortable, and it is. It is very uncomfortable. And so she came to kind of my little booth where I was, and um, and it was one of those things where, like, my first instinct was kind of like, oh, do I, you know, do I really want to engage with this? 
you know, the way, the way all of us do, the way all of us are like, yeah. do I have time in my life right now? Do I have the emotional availability? And, you know, I did that little inventory and I said, okay, I, I think I can, can handle this. And I immediately, and this is the thing that caught me, it immediately reminded me of the story in um, Ovid's Metamorphoses of um, Zeus and Hermes kind of going door to door in town, trying to find somebody who would, you know, take them in for the night. And I was like, hmm, this, this is probably just a person that needs somebody to talk to. But if, what if they were, what if it were a God? What if it were a spirit? Uh, what you know, what if it were a fairy? Um, what if this person were something other Jesus. than human? Right. That story, we, uh, that was the one that I thought of. <laughs> Yeah. What, you, what would you do? You know, and it doesn't, ha and we shouldn't have to necessarily, we should be treating everybody with kindness in these kind of terms, but for, you know, but it's helpful, you know, I think to also be thinking of like what this person at least bears a piece of the divine in them. They yeah. are worthy of, of some attention. And so literally you just sat down with her for maybe 10, 15 minutes, um, listen to what she had to say, uh, which, you know, I wish I'd paid more attention quite frankly, because it's one of those things where I'm like, well, what if it was a divine message and I missed it? Um, <laughs> but, you know, just kind of listening to her and, and chatting with her and got her some water and stuff like that. And then she just moved on. She just went on her own way. Um, but it was, but it was because of these experiences where it was like, you know, facing that deer in the woods and thinking, you know what, just because it's happening in the broad light of day, just because it's happening in what I think of as the real world does not diminish for a second that it is a, an enchanted magical experience even if it's a terrifying one or a scary one or an uncomfortable one um i have to be willing to kind of confront that and then act as though this is this is enchantment in the world which is a big thing for me so okay that makes me happy <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you're out because you have a podcast and books mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, have you ever had any, what does your family think about that? Have you had any, like the, your neighborhood store, do they, well, I, I guess it's kind of a niche thing to know, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you get no any results here. from it? Like <laughs> negative I mean, or no positive? one seems to, yeah, no one seems to particularly care, um, that I, that I encounter, you know, and, and my thing is I'm, I'm out, but it's really more of a, like it would take somebody 10 seconds to Google me and find tons of stuff and no one ever bothers to do that. So, um, so it doesn't bother me if they ask, I'm willing to, to chat about it. If they're confrontational about it, then I might say, well, okay, then that's what you think. And, and I'm done with this conversation, which is fine. Um, I've only had a very, very s small number of conflict moments. Um, one in college where I was working a our sort of pagan um, uh, student group uh, table at a, you know, one of those big kind of like come and learn about all the different groups on campus fairs. And we had some, um, you know, uh, evangelical folks come over and start getting very confrontational with us, um, which, you know, uh, and I'm very positive on, on, on a lot of, well, I mean, my wife is, is evangelical, uh, Christian denomination. So I'm generally very, very friendly towards that. But, but when it's, when it's being brought against, you know, people, particularly in, in a situation where they can't just like get up and walk away because we were kind of like, well, we have to stay at this booth. Yeah. Um, then, then I have some, some issues with it. Uh, and so that was, that was a little bit of a problem. Um, and, you know, I've had occasional brushes with folks in other kind of sort of that are from sort of specific church backgrounds. Um, but nothing, nothing major, uh, you know, I, I, it, it, the college I teach at, I don't think anybody's even really, they're aware that I've published a book and that I do folklore things. I don't think they have any conception. I, except for there's like one or two of them that are very like, Hey, we know. And they're like, we love it. We're totally with you. Like we would form a coven at the school if we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's kind of fun. Um, that's so yeah. weird and, that they're oblivious. That's just people, weird. People aren't interested in, in finding that much out about their coworkers or their, you know, their neighbors, I guess. Oh, I'm very um, nosy. Unless their neighbors do something terrible. <laughs> so. I'm very nosy. That's why I have this podcast. <laughs> are you the, are you the, uh, what is it? Agnes from, uh, from Bewitched? <laughs> well, like... other than being a complete bitch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and like looking at the curtains, like what's going on? <laughs> yeah. I'm nosy. <laughs> That's okay. 
That's good. You're informed. That's what that's what we are. You're informed. I like knowing stuff. Fair enough. <clears throat> but yeah, and with my family, you know, my parents are both gone. Um, and I was I was out. I didn't get a chance to, to come out in any way to my mom um, before she passed. My dad. <laughs> um, so I actually, uh, I really wanted to, to come out to my dad who... Um, was he was actually the music director for um, a Presbyterian and then later a Methodist church. Um, if, even though he had kind of gone through an atheist phase at one point in his life too. Um, but so I left a note, I was in college at the time and I left a note on his desk that said, dad, we need to talk. And then I went off to school for the day and I came home and I was like, did you get my note? And he's like, uh, yeah. Do you, do you want to go sit and talk now? So we went and sat down and I said, dad, I'm a witch. I practice this kind of pagan religion thing. And he just kind of let a big sigh out and goes, Oh, thank God. I thought you were going to tell me you were on drugs. <laughs> 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 it's like, Oh, okay. So this is not the conflict that I was thinking it was going to be. And I gave him Scott Cunningham's um, truth about witchcraft today, which I think, you know, he skimmed and, you know, he just wasn't, it, it, it didn't bother him, um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't something he cared about and that wasn't something he was going to try and win me over about. He just was glad that I was not, you know, high on cocaine. Okay. Just so you're not destroying your life. I think that's nice. Right. Yeah. It was like, you know, <laughs> like I'm not going to come with you on that journey, but I'm glad you're having a fun time. Please stay off the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. I'm like, okay, that's, if that's what I get, that's what I get. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> What would you say is your big, the biggest motivator in your practice? Mm. So I mentioned earlier this idea of enchantment um, in the world. That is the longstanding, deepest underlying thing for me. Um, is I want, I want the world to be an enchanted place. I find that it is already, um, but I find for a lot of people it doesn't feel that way. So I try to do anything I can that will add a layer of enchantment to the world and enchantment doesn't necessarily mean, you know, happy go lucky, you know, sugar plums and dancing rainbows everywhere, but it, you know, it can be scary stuff too. It can be very, very enchantment runs all over the place. So it can be stuff that's exciting and scary. It can be stuff that's exciting and, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in educational informative. I just did something, um, a month or two ago, kind of at the very end of summer where I went around and, we have these kind of little like walking paths in our town and I kept walking by and being like, man, there's all these really cool plants that are just right by these walking paths. Like there's mugwort growing wild here. Um, there's these, um, uh, there's wild, you know, these mulberry trees that people don't realize are here that you can eat the mulberries on, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I, so I took a piece of chalk and I would just go down the sidewalk and I would label kind of each one and write a little quick, you know, two or three words about um, what each of them could do like I was like this is mugwort um it used to be used in beer brewing you know this uh you know this is mulberry this is uh you know related to the tree that um chinese silkworms make silk out of and like all this kind of stuff that i'd kind of but that you know is that witchcraft not directly but for me it is that that mission of re-enchanting the world um and so that's the kind of stuff that i'm really that that motivates virtually everything i do from the podcast to the book to uh walking around town with a piece of chalk in my pocket to um you know the spells that i do it's it's all about there has to be re-enchantment in the world for me when you i listened to that episode of the podcast mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you said that it just delighted me <laughs> if i had been a little kid finding that it would have been magic <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I hope that's true. I hope somebody like came upon it and was like, this is great. I, you know what I also hope? I hope that there's somebody that came upon it and was like, hmm, this is interesting, but there's more. And like, and they decide to yeah. come out and do something similar. Yes. Like, that's what I want. That's really <laughs> what I want. Or to be like, hmm, he got this slightly wrong. Let's talk about this, this part of this thing. So I would love that. Do you ever feel self-doubt or feel like you have feel like an imposter and if you do how do you deal with it and if you don't never mind 
no no uh <laughs> w- one uh you know my primary job is as an academic which means that it is 24 7 imposter syndrome two i'm a gemini sun with a pisces moon and a scorpio rising so the wow like it's that <laughs> that's sort of like i have to put on the, the face of knowing exactly what i'm talking about but inside i am falling apart <laughs> so um so yeah there's there's definitely a lot of that um and it's funny because it, it's so funny because i'm almost always sure that like the next time i talk to somebody about whatever subject it is that's going to be the time that's they're going to find me out they're going to suddenly uncover like oh they don't know anything about this because they don't know this and this and this and this and this and it you know makes me work really really hard to try to learn things which is i guess a good thing out of it although it's exhausting too but um i relate to this so much because people are asking me stuff on here and i'm like nope never heard of that i don't know what you're talking about (laughs) right right and like but that's what's so fascinating i get to do it publicly (laughs) yeah yeah and when you do it publicly like that's the thing is like people sort of expect something or it feels like they expect something out of you but a lot of times what i found is um one uh, once they start asking me questions, I'm always surprised by the fact, like I just did an interview earlier this week with a bunch of um, folklorists um, where we were talking about stuff and they wanted to ask questions about folk magic. And I was like, oh man, is this going to go off the rails because I'm not academic enough for them? And as soon as they started asking stuff, I was like, it was just stuff came out really quickly. And I was like, oh, I guess I had this untapped reservoir of stuff I <laughs> I know that And they were like, yeah, oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. It's like, oh, I guess they didn't, they don't know as much about this subject as I do. And so I maybe need to stop making that assumption. (laughs) Um, And then the other side of that is also like, if I don't know something, um, all I have to do is say, oh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, I I wasn't aware of that. Or can you tell me more about that? Or where can I find out more about that? And that seems to be fine. People, people are okay with you not knowing everything um surprise surprise so. <laughs> i'm not okay with me not knowing everything <laughs> <laughs> no no we fight we fight we fight ourselves more than we fight anybody else i think what do you most desire from your practice or for your practice mm. uh i mean definitely that that enchantment thing is is always going to be present um I, I definitely, I, I want my, I want my practice to, I don't know. I guess I want my practice to, to be something that I am, I'm able to pass on to other people and inspire them to, to do, do their own, their own forms of these kind of folk practices, these own, their, you know, to, to make folk magic their own without necessarily, you know, I don't want people, you know, going in and pirating from cultures that are not theirs or anything like that right but but i do want people to to be open to learning about their own folk cultures and learning about other people's folk cultures you know for comparison for for you know dialogue and discussion um things like that and and i i really would love for the witchcraft that i do um to to one kind of serve the goals that i have but then be something that can be passed on um into the world uh at large so that people can can do their own version uh, of that witchcraft too. So that's very much um, sort of within my practice. And then, you know, of course, like I said, obviously I kind of want, <laughs> I want my spells to work. <laughs> I want to be able to cast the spell and be like, I really need $10 for lunch today. And it's like, Ooh, $10 in the parking lot. Fantastic. So. I, I want that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that's. Quite. I have had some good money spells that work where it's sort of like, I need this money and, you know. Suddenly next... a 20 blows th- down the street. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And you just kind of like, oh, that was very lucky. And like, but there's always the double edge sort of that where it's sort of like, did, did somebody die for this? <laughs> you always yeah. kind of wear like, oh my the gosh, the monkey's paw. The monkey's paw. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, here's a dumb story. <laughs> My mom, we were, it, well, I don't even think I was born yet. She was, they were going somewhere like down to the river or something for a, like a party. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And she had broken the lid of her styrofoam cooler. And she was like, dang, I wish I could find another lid. And another lid blew down the street at her. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Thank so... you, styrofoam god. <laughs> <laughs> And now, just whenever I find myself wishing for something, I'm like, no, don't wish for that. Wish for 
prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> Don't so wish funny. you could you could get a cheeseburger right now. Wish for something important. Right. Well, it's it's so funny because like we do feel like we we have to save this up for for something else. Yeah, and we're going to run out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like there's a fear of that. Uh, you know, one of the things that you know, Peter Padden used to say was that the universe sort of takes you at your word. So if you, I think that those concrete, very specific goals, like, boy, I really want a cheeseburger with onions and barbecue sauce right now. Oh my gosh. When you kind of speak that out into the world, then it's sort of like the universe is like, oh, I know how to do that. Boom. Here you go. Cheeseburger with onions and barbecue sauce, you know? Um, but when you're like, I would like prosperity. Well, then you need to be able to kind of use that metaphorical language of spell work to, to bring that into, into play. Um, because it needs to the universe the, or whatever sort of is manifesting that that result for you is is going to need those sort of interpretive guidelines that the spell provides i think okay well in the real reality uh, <laughs> i didn't want to sound like a greedy guts in reality i'm like <laughs> i wish for a million dollars that nobody has to die for <laughs> that's right. what i really wish for <laughs> right yeah and then the universe is kind of like well can't do that unless I say here's a quarter. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. yeah. Realistically, like, I wish for a million dollars, but <laughs> yeah. no. And I mean, we have to be, yeah, that's the other side of it is that it has to be within the scope of, of reality. Um, even though it's magic, there, there's, a, there are sort of real boundaries on that. I think. I still wish for it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> wish away. Do it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. Who knows? <laughs> What would you say your biggest struggle is when it comes to witchcraft? Mm, that um, that sense of uh, of imposter syndrome can certainly impact it, but there's also, for sure, there's this sense of you know wanting to wanting to have a good, honest, open exchange about you know exchange of perspectives and ideas um, without without trampling on somebody else's culture, which is very very difficult. Um, um, at, at times to do because no one person speaks for an entire culture. So sometimes you'll sort of find a boundary with one person that doesn't exist with another person. And so then they're kind of left in the space of like, well, you know, do I, do I stay at the boundary line that this other person established or do I listen to the, this other, this, this new person who has maybe more flexibility on that? Is there a middle ground for this? Um, you know, can we have just the conversation about it? Um, you know, F Firelight has a really good um, discussion in his book about gates versus windows. Um, and, you know, that you can be looking in from the outside through a window and, and definitely learn things and understand things a little bit better um, without necessarily having access to them directly. Um, or you can go through the gate, in which case you may have to get permission. You may have to um, have, you know, a, a, a a key for that particular lock, so to speak. Um, but whatever it is, um, you have to kind of be able to discern the difference between those two things. And that's very, you know, witchcraft because it is so um, decentralized and oftentimes disorganized, that can be a real challenge to say like, oh, you know, I've learned really interesting techniques from hoodoo practitioners, but I wouldn't ever at this point in my life, I would never go so far as to be like, well, I am a hoodoo practitioner because I do not, I do not belong to the culture that I perceive as having authority over hoodoo. Um, so unless somebody up from that culture says, yes, you are a hoodoo practitioner, um, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to co-opt that terminology, even though I'm, you know, have, have picked up some techniques and methods by being taught by people from within that community. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to sort of co-opt those and, and say that those are mine. Um, I'm try I try to be very respectful about where they, they come from, if that makes sense. I would love for that to be in giant letters <laughs> <laughs> on a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah. What's brought you the most joy either in your practice or with the podcast? Hmm, working with Lane for sure. I mean, she is, she, she is one of those people who, um, you know, it's, it can be really hard to make adult friends. I think. Sometimes, yeah. um, once you're kind of past high school and if you do college, hard, you past college and especially like friends that you don't like work with or anything. And when she and I like became friends while, while kind of doing a community theater show together, it really clicked 
And then we started doing kind of magic and podcasting and all this other stuff. She got me into, she's the one who got me into Buffy the Vampire Slayer at all. And it was just this, this thing where it was like, it was a, it was a really beautiful adult friendship um, that has a lot of, you know, depth and richness to it. We really, you know, um, she, she is sort of aunt lane to my kids. Uh, you know, uh, that's how they, they, they don't call her aunt lane because that's, that's not the name they know her as, but, but they, that she has that aunt role to them. Um, and, and there's within our practice, you know, anytime we can get together and work on, um, magic, it, it's always better. It's always some of the best magic I can do, um, working with her and then, um, doing the podcast with her. It's, it's so funny. Cause there are times when I'm like, Oh, I just don't feel like doing this tonight. Um, and it's funny cause half the time then she'll text me and be like, do we have to record tonight? Can we put it off? And I'm like, yeah, we can put it off. That's great. I was thinking the same thing. And then the other half the time I'll get on the the line with her and we'll just start talking. And it's like, oh, this is great. I'm totally into it again. And there's just something about that dynamic. So, so yeah, Lane for sure is a huge part of, uh, of why the podcast is still around. Uh, and, and she, she really is um, a, a huge part of the enchantment of the, in the world that I see. So. That makes me so happy. I got warm when you talked about it. <laughs> like in that pleasant. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. Aww. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to have people that, you know, you can connect with, uh, you know, on that level. So. Does your partner practice? And if they do, how does their practice interact with your own? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, obviously here we're separating out Lane as my sort of magical partner from my, um, you know, my, my domestic partner or my spouse, um, uh, now my spouse, um, does not, uh, as I said earlier, um, she belongs to an evangelical, uh, Christian denomination. Um, one, it's, it, it's one of the ones that's normally pretty, like people think of it as pretty conservative, um, to the point where like, they don't allow instruments in church because the Bible specifically doesn't, doesn't say to use instruments in church. Um, so <laughs> they're very like, if it ain't, if it, if it's not literally in, the um the sort of uh you know not king james version of the bible but the sort of like new international version of the bible if it's not in this sort of um you know protestant tradition version of the bible then you know we don't we don't do that because we can't be sure that that's what they want but that being said it's it's also a very socially um depending on the kind of the, the one that you're at because they're all kind of independent um a lot of the denomination that she belongs to are very into um, social justice. So there is a lot of like, um, working towards ensuring sort of, uh, equal human rights for everybody. Um, you know, counterbalancing some of the sort of the ravages of, um, you know, quote unquote civilization and imperialism and things like that. So there are some very, very good things that, that this denomination does. So I don't want to paint it with like a too broad of a brush, if that makes sense. Um, but that being the case, there is definitely a conflict, um, because, a kind of essential formal tenet within um, Christianity is that it is kind of the one true way. And I'm obviously not following that one true way. So there, there's definitely, there's definitely some, I think some sadness on her part uh, about that. Um, it, we've never been, you know, we've never, we've never been, you know, dishonest about, you know, who we are. Um, we've always been kind of together on, you know, you know, on, this is going to be uh, something that we're, we're maybe, maybe never going to agree on. Um, and as the kids have gotten older, I think it's become a little more difficult, but we try to be really, we try to be really sensitive to and kind to each other about the practices we have. Um, so for a long time, I was going to church with her and the kids every week um, you know, participating in that, uh, when COVID hit, I, it's, I really have not been back to the physical church building very much at all. Um, just because it, for me, it's an unnecessary <laughs> thing to do as a risk. Um, but when they were live streaming the church things, I would sort of pay attention to that and we would, you know, get together in the living room and, and do stuff like that. So there is, you know, I do try to participate at least somewhat within the framework of her religion. She does not feel comfortable participating in my framework, but she, she's perfectly happy to give me the space to do that. Um, and to sort of ha let the kids have a little bit of space to, to learn about my practices as well. So my kids have tarot cards, that's okay. 
Um, she doesn't really want to talk to them about it because she's not particularly comfortable with that, but she's fine with me kind of interacting with them, um, discussing those. And, um, you know, my kids have been getting interested in doing some spells recently. Uh, so we've done some, you know, little, little spells to help sort of, um, get their goals in line and things like that. And my wife, you know, will just kind of not be there for those and, and that's fine. Um, so it's just a sort of, you know, um, you know, respectful, but, but at a distance kind of approach, um, from her side of that. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not, um, it, it's, it's not something where we are in conflict particularly. And, and one of the really important things is that both of us have a lot of the same beliefs about kind of, um, the, the role of compassion and kindness and humility and, um, and, and showing kind of, uh, open-mindedness to other people. Um, and that's from her perspective, very much inspired by how she interprets her faith. And from my perspective is also part of my faith. And because of that, there is common ground, particularly for how we interact with the world around us and how we interact with the people around us. Um, even if the sort of philosophical differences and the practical, um, way that we do our religion, even if that stuff is different, at least we have um, a sort of core philosophy that aligns us, if that makes sense. So basically courtesy can get you through that. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. Well, I mean, just, I mean, it's, it comes from kindness and compassion. It's absolutely, we both want to treat each other with compassion and with kindness and believe in the best of, of each other's intentions. And so that really does, you know, if we have rocky spots, then that's, that's what we, we sort of lean on and we say, okay, well, I trust you that you're working from a place of compassion and kindness and yeah. Okay. We'll just kind of go with that. And, and that gets us through a lot. Do you feel like your physical environment, like location and things you grew up around shaped your practice and how do you think it might be different if you lived say in the desert where I live, or if you lived mm -hmm. on a, the coast where you had ready access to the ocean? That's a really good question. I used to fantasize about living up in Maine, honestly. Um, oh, that was where I no, was No, it's cold up there. <laughs> it is very cold. I love winter. Um, winter's my, my, my season. I'm actually, um, my thing is like, you can always add more layers when you're cold, but you can only get so naked <laughs> if you're hot. So, <laughs> um, so I tend to prefer being cold to being hot. So I'm very, very okay with uh, winter. Uh, and snow and ice and stuff like that. And so Maine um, was a place I wanted to go live because you also had the ocean very, very close there. Um, where I live now, I, I really like the, the winters um, because we get snow, which is just wonderful. We also have, I also happen to live in Amish country. So it literally looks like a courier and I have this like a uh, winter scene print as the like horse drawn carriages go, go by in the snowy landscape with farmland. Behind them. <laughs> so um and where I grew up um, in the South very much influenced um, the way I think about the world because it, the South is a haunted place. Um, and I mean that on a lot of levels, it's haunted by its history, which is not good uh, in a lot of times, but sometimes it's brilliant and wonderful. Um, uh, it's haunted by uh, its kind of current, um, it, a lot of kind of the current things that go on in the South, which is sort of reckoning with its history and its legacy. It's haunted by spirits and ghosts very readily. There's lots of like strange creatures and things like that. It's haunted by magic. And oftentimes that magic is um, the magic of somebody, you know, transforming into something pretty terrifying or uh, slipping out of their skin at the night and night. Um, but also, you know, a belief that, you know, just the, the right phrase and putting your hand on somebody can heal them or that you can find water underground by, by pulling a stick off of a tree, you know? So there's a lot of that that has influenced me to sort of see the world as enchanted. Um, and I try to try to, you know, uh, you know, it, it, having lived in the South and then kind of living here in the North, um, there's a difference. There's a very different feel, but there's, there's enchantment everywhere. Um, and that's one of the things that I try to spend time doing is really getting to know the place and understand what that enchantment is. So the town I'm living in now has a, um, a natural, um, a natural kind of Creek that runs through it. That's fed by these three natural Springs that start in one of our local parks. And like, uh, I have sort of developed a personal mythology around those three Springs and who they are and getting to know them, um, and understanding kind of, um, 
their relationship to the place that I'm living in. And so that makes that water very sort of holy for me, very sacred. And I can use it for, um, for purposes that, you know, you might use holy water for in a lot of cases. So, so yeah, that regionality very much shapes what I'm doing. I would have originally said not so much, Mm -hmm. but now that I'm going back to, I have another friend named Corey (laughs) (laughs) and I was telling him how I do things out here. And he said, you know, you're still doing stuff like you did when you grew up. I mean, he didn't Mm -hmm. say exactly that, but that was the gist. And I thought, oh yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Six with you. Is this Corey B from? Yeah. 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 They're (laughs) delightful. I love, I love them. Me too. Yeah. Who would you say are the bi- three biggest influences on your practice? Mm, I mean, Lane, <laughs> huge, huge one, obviously. Uh, Peter Padden, I, you know, I've mentioned him a couple of times at this point. Um, very much uh, a, a big influence in terms of getting me interested in folk witchcraft uh, at all, and then kind of helping me sort of understand, like, oh, I need to to go in a specific direction with it. Um, so he was he was very influential. Um, and then, I mean, there are, uh, there is no shortage of of people that have been influential, kind of beyond beyond them. Um, uh, I would say uh, I've got several like pe- real life people, friends of mine. Um, uh, Ralph from the Holy Haven podcast has been very, very um, good about kind of keeping me in tune with the sort of space that I'm in here, um, or. Um, you know, I might point to uh, Judica Elish, who, <laughs> if you look at her giant encyclopedias of yeah. five thousand spells <laughs> and like her reference section, it's like, well, yeah, for sure, I need to need to do need to do at least as much work as she's doing for every book, if not if not more, because she's amazing. Um, Laura Tempest Zekroff has been hugely, hugely influential on the way I do sigil work, um, and also is the person who kind of. Uh, you know, flew me down the chimney of the the editor for the book, um, and got me started on this whole thing writing the book as well. The whole she's so great. <laughs> she's great. She's delightful. She is really, really a wonderful person. I've been um, aware of her for like twenty years when I was belly dancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she. It's so funny how many communities she's she's kind of in, right? Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, so there's there's a ton of people. I mean, I'd also say like we have this Discord server for our podcast, and I have gotten to a point now where like they are all my friends, and I love them so much. Um, so like when I get, when I get a chance to kind of check in with them, it's like it's like getting to go sit in a coffee shop with uh, like all your friends that you've never actually met or seen in person in some yes. cases. <laughs> yes. Um, and they are very influential because they'll kind of um, like we just recently did something through our discord server where we came up with kind of a group egregore um and we we decided we were just going to do this little egregore experiment um and we now we have this little egregore that all of us kind of interact with and work with and, and like we'll share stories about like how this thing manifests in our lives it's 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 just so sweet and kind and people are just so enthusiastic and wonderful and i love it love it to bits and pieces so that's so <laughs> Similar to other things I've been experiencing lately. <laughs> Yay! Are you are you finding like this like that online community like a good strong online community? Yeah, the Witch Bitch Amateur Hour podcast coven, and yeah. we have ours named Jim. <laughs> oh, that's so great! <laughs> yes. See this like this egregore thing. What is going on? It's yeah, so great. I love it. It's real weird. Yeah. Who would you like to hear story? Who would like to, who do you think I should have on the show? And like somebody that you would like to hear this kind of conversation from. Have you had Tempest on yet? Laura Tempest at Croft? No, I'm afraid to ask her. <laughs> you shouldn't be afraid. She's delightful. And she's very approachable, very friendly. I mean, if she's busy. It may be hard to get a response sometimes, but like she is, she's usually very, very open to chatting. Um, and she's, she is so giving uh, in conversation. So I would definitely, um, suggest her and then if you haven't had do you, do you know who via hedera is have you heard of via hedera i've heard the name so she wrote a book called um uh folklore i think it's called tradition either folkloric american witchcraft or traditional american witchcraft uh, and the multicultural experience um and she is this amazing um woman located in kind of the pacific northwest who has done this uh, just delightful amount of kind of in-depth research on folk magic um and but she's very real she also does like sculpture and uh like these amazing like um 
sort of like botanical women sculptures where she'll actually incorporate pieces of the botanical um, that she's that like, so if she, she made like a coffee goddess and she incorporated coffee into the actual clay that she used to make the, the sculpture and things like that. So just a fascinating person, very cool, um, very cool stuff that she gets into with her, um, uh, her folklore and her folk magic as well. So I would, highly highly recommend uh checking checking her out and approaching her about um being on the show because she has she's got stories she's super got stories she'd be really fascinating to talk to okay cool so is there anything else that i didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about well i mean uh you know I'd, i'd be kind of i'd be kind of curious um when you think about your the way that you kind of practice your witchcraft, um, you know, are there, are there, while you're doing this podcast, right? So you're practicing witchcraft and you're doing this podcast, which means you're talking to a lot of practitioners. And I know for me, one of the things that I find as I talk to more practitioners is I always wind up taking little pieces of what they've said and thinking about them and sort of sometimes they'll shape my practice. Like they'll sort of reshape me. I'm kind of curious. Um, do you find that happening to you with this podcast? Are you absolutely? Yeah. Are there any like standout ones that you're like, yes, this really shaped something uh, about my practice. I have a goofy thing that happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite what you're asking, but it still makes me laugh. So I'm going to tell it. Um, Jasmine Atten. I don't remember if her interview came. Yeah, I think it did. I think it was the most recent one. She said, do spiritual baths, get some lemongrass and and put it in your bath. And I have lemongrass going on in the yard because Mm -hmm. I don't know. We just do. And I was in the shower and I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, I could just go get some lemongrass. So I got out of the shower, (laughs) put a towel on, went outside, smashed some lemongrass because it's pretty close to the front door. And came inside and I just had this lemongrass in my hand and I thought, well, maybe I'll just ball it up and use it as a scrub, like a scrubby. Uh huh. <laughs> that was a mistake because it's like knives. Uh huh. <laughs> and it looked like I was attacked by a cat. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I know that's not what you were asking, but that's what it made me think of. <laughs> right. So like you, you took her advice to heart and then, you yes. know. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. Almost, almost stabbed yourself in, in the heart doing yes. so. That's hilarious. But uh, I am, uh, everybody's bringing up ancestors. Everyone. It seems like that's mm-hmm. like the hot topic lately, unless I've just been out of the loop my entire life. But yes, I have recently started bringing in ancestor work, which I've never done before. Are you are you finding, do you find it's rewarding or are you finding it's something where you're, you, you're, you're not quite sure what to do with it yet? I only started yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So put a bit in that. <laughs> let literally you know. new. <laughs> um, Other things I don't really know. I, I, I have not had time to consider that. So I don't know. <laughs> sure. No, fair enough. Have, um, have you read um, Mallory Vaudois? Um, I'm in the middle of it and it's so good. good. <laughs> it's so good. It's really good. If, if you're looking for something that helps you kind of make sense yes, of it all, that's so the good. book I recommend. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very absorbing, right? Like you get into it. Like there's the yes. <laughs> there's the story of her getting locked in the bathroom at the beginning, yes. which is so great. But then, like it, she really does kind of make it make sense. I think, which is is really really good. Yeah. Um, I am also curious. So you're you've you've been doing this for like two years now. Is that right? This being what? The podcast. No, I only started in June. June. Oh man, you've got a lot of episodes. I was thinking, I was thinking you were, you were doing this. That's because uh, I'm crazy. <laughs> I know. It's great. I love this. Um, so, um, so you've been doing this, uh, for a while, which also means that you're kind of like engaging with, I, I imagine kind of the internet world of witchcraft and social media. Yes. And I'd be curious kind of, what are your experiences like with that so far? Versus what? I don't know. Versus maybe, um, so, so now you're kind of in, you know, it, it, it's something where like at a certain point you can kind of be receptive. Like you can kind of be involved with social media, sort of receiving and just sort of choosing when you get to engage, right? Like you can choose when you, um, you know, respond to somebody's comment or something like that. 
But once you start producing something like this, like a podcast, um, I feel like you then have to sort of be the referee for certain conversations or you become sort of a a central pivot point for conversations. So like if you happen to have a guest on that says something um, that people are like, well, wait a second, what do they mean by this? I I don't know if that's happened to you yet or not. I'm dreading it. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll be the one. Maybe I'll be the one who wrecks it all up. But it like, has not happened yet and I'm afraid of it. So I don't know what to yeah. tell you. <laughs> yeah, I know that's, that's fair. Um, but I mean, like, do you have any, like, how, how do you interact with the, the sort of witchy world via internet and social media? Like, are there ones that you enjoy interacting with? Or are there platforms that you're like, I stay away from that for, for fear of? I stay away from TikTok mainly mm-hmm. because I tend to get sucked into lunacy and just in hilarity and i i can't spend all that time on there (laughs) Mm -hmm. also i don't know how to work it very well Mm -hmm. i mean as a as a somewhat as a content creator sure yeah uh i don't do twitter very much just because uh, i don't have i have a lot to say (laughs) (laughs) i don't do amino because i don't really like being on my phone i do everything on the actual computer Mm mm-hmm I've I'm comfortable on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, is there anything else I get on lately? Marco Polo is my new thing, but that's people that I know. Yeah, my wife my wife really likes that for staying in touch with her friends for sure. Now I have two last questions that yep. you well, unless you've listened at the end of the other episodes because they're on there. But if you don't know what they are, the first one well, they're not even questions. Number one, please recommend something to the listeners, anything at all. Ooh, uh, Owl House. I'm going to recommend Owl House. Um, I'm a big fan of animation. Um, This is uh, a Disney show. Uh, I know Disney is um, a a monstrous entity that will destroy us all, but they do, they do make good things sometimes too. Um, And this is, uh, it's a cartoon show from the people. It's partly from the people who created um, Gravity Falls, which if anybody watches that, um, it's a wonderful, weird little show. Um, and then this is all about a young uh, Latina woman named Luz who winds up trapped in a world where magic is real. Um, she also is the first, uh, she's the first queer person of color uh, protagonist for a Disney cartoon show. Um, Cause she's, she's bi. So she, her main relationship is actually with another woman in this, in this show. Um, and then she's everything they do, like the magic, like the sigils that they make and things like that. I'm like, that's not fake. The sigil oh. that they've drawn there. And I, one of the writers for the show is a, is a person named Molly Knox Ostertag, who wrote a series of graphic novels called Witch Boy. Um, and they clearly do a lot of research on the occult stuff that goes into it. So um, if you're looking for something to watch with kids, that's really entertaining and really enjoyable, but also has a nice little witchy thing going on on the side. This is the show to watch called Owl House. I wonder if Disney realizes that. I, I I'm think sure the writers do, but I wonder if Disney does. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think somebody in Disney is probably aware, like, huh, this seems like there are people talking about how authentic this is, but I wonder what they mean by that. And they don't realize, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, some of these sigils. I'm like, like, they're not going to do the thing that the sigil does in the show, but I look at them and I'm like, that seems like an alchemical sigil. <laughs> like, I've seen, I've seen <laughs> some of those markings before. So. Okay, last thing. It's usually my favorite thing. Mm-hmm. please tell me a story that you love to tell it can be about anything at all mm, okay uh let's see i don't know do i want to go sad or do i want to go <laughs> want to go happy or like bittersweet um uh okay uh this should this should give you a sense of personality uh for who i am so my best friend and i uh in high school um we used to sit in this, this history class and we had this very kind of like grizzled uh you know in, it, you, we always one year away from retirement history teacher uh who clearly like chain smoked cigarettes between classes like on the back <laughs> loading dock and stuff like that um and she was she was just uh really like hard edged and everything like that but she would let us get away with the craziest stuff um uh, in her class and so one of the things that we used to do was uh while we were sitting in the middle of our of our history exams. Like we'd all be taking exams and everything like that. And either my friend or I would just very quietly kind of under our breath while we're doing exams, we would start going and then the other one would chime in from somewhere else in the room. And so we'd have two people going 
da 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 and it would reach a point where we would have a good third to half of the class starting to do this in the middle of the exam. And all of a sudden, just like, and it gets louder and louder going, dun, 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 dun. Uh, bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally she would look up and she would look at one of us and she'd go, Bob, Corey, stop that. <laughs> but she'd let it go on for so long before she'd stop it. So um, yeah, always, always been a little bit of a force of, of mischief and mayhem, I think. Uh, and uh, <laughs> under the influence of, of others who are the forces of mischief and mayhem. So hopefully that gives you a sense of just, just what kind of lunatic you brought onto your show at this point. That story is goals. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I want to be that kid. It was great. It was fun. We were, because the thing is, like, we were good students, too. Like, and she knew that we were good students. We stayed engaged. <laughs> and, like, we would, you know, we would do the, like, the kind of crazy, silly things. And, you know, uh, it, you know, just randomly kind of riff on things in class and all this. You know, like, <laughs> like, like she'd be talking about, like, any, you know, and what were the colonists afraid of? And, like, we would just rip time and, like, pirates, plagues, sea monsters. And, like, just start, like, <laughs> shouting things back and forth. <laughs> like and she would always let it go way longer than I think she should have. And she'd be like, Bob, Corey, stop it. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, lots of fun. Really, really fun. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been really fun. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I know. Uh, I don't know if your audience will know that we've had the technical difficulties we've had, but it has been delightful <laughs> nonetheless. Hopefully, they don't. <laughs> this was so seamless what do you mean technical difficulties <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile loki is dancing around in the code you know? oh my gosh he needs yep. to mind his business <laughs> for sure <laughs> well thank you so much kim i've really enjoyed this no good thank you and i will see you later unless you're gone already no i'm still here okay <laughs> Just, I, was, I thought that was, i thought you were like <laughs> closing up the show so i was like i didn't want to say anything else and be like bye but i guess i'll say bye Bye! <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast, Twitter at Average Witch Pod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Your Average Witch Podcast, at Your Average Witch Podcast.com, and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise. And I will see you later, unless you're gone already. No, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> Just, I, was, I, thought that was, I thought you were like <laughs> closing up the show. So I was like, I didn't want to say anything else and be like, bye. But I guess I'll say bye. Bye. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast. Twitter at Average Witch Pod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Your Average Witch Podcast, at Your Average Witch Podcast.com, and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to Your Average Witch Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the moon changes. <laughs> <laughs>